All right, testing. One, two, three, testing. I see green lights moving around. That's good. I think we're actually alive. Huzzah. Greetings, greetings, travelers. How y'all doing today? A happy Wednesday to you all. It's a great day for hockey. Hockey's back. And a great day to talk about astronomy. It's always a good day to talk about astronomy. So we do here. If you're new to the channel, welcome. How'd you find us? We appreciate you showing up. My name is Mike. This is Earthshine Education. It's a small mom and pop. <laughs> Probably shouldn't make the actual popping sound there. This is a small mom and pop uh, astronomy shop, so to speak. We love to talk about astronomy and astrophysics and uh, earth sciences and other things. As we see fit, let's fade this thing out. There we go. There we go. Perfect. So, if you haven't already done so, please click the like, subscribe, whatever. Depends on which application you are using. We are streaming live to Facebook and to Twitch and to YouTube. Uh, we're going to try to add a couple other things to be able to live stream to a bunch of other places at the same time. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. I did the greeting. We did that. Uh, said the hockey thing. Uh, got my little list of things I want to talk about. Oh, want to wish a happy birthday to a special friend of mine, Emily. It's your birthday. I love you, sweetheart. Happy birthday out there. Wish we could hang out. We're far apart, unfortunately, but. My heart is with you. Happy birthday to you. Now, you might hear some danglies in the background. We do have special guest, Sirius, our dachshund is here. Yes, he is named after a star. We will talk about that star in just a little bit. Alcyone, our cat, is also named after a star. Uh, she is hanging out. Uh, we will be talking about those particular stars a little bit later in our show. Feel free at any point to interrupt me with a message in chat. Uh, that's what we're here for. Now, this is not just me talking out into the... Screaming into the void! This is supposed to be an interactive show. Treat this as a planetarium. In fact, that's what we kind of have going on in front of us. You should see my mouse moving around. Uh, and the sun hanging out in the sky. Uh, this is our planetarium software. You can download this for free. I am not affiliated with them. I just use the software because I like it. It is called Stellarium. Stellarium.org. Go ahead and look it up in your favorite uh, search Uh, Google, Bing, whatever you happen to use. Uh, look it up. This is, again, Stellarium. You can download this for free and be able to look around the sky uh, with us or just on your own. You can use this actually to even run a planetarium if you so choose, and that's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, we're going to be jumping around through different softwares. Greetings, friend. How are you? Serious? Why are you growling at me? We're doing a live show, buddy. So this is actually a representation of the sky, the way it is outside right now. So we have our planetarium facing the sun. Please do not go outside and stare at the sun. Uh, that is never a good idea. Because staring at the sun will hurt your eyes. We are occasionally going to have little screens popping up. That's just because I'm going to be using the software to its fullest potential. Not really. Uh, I'm just doing the best I can here. We're going to be watching the sun drifting from east to west. Now, the sun will rise in the east and set in the western sky. So you'll see the sun drifting its way across here. Serious. We're doing a live show, buddy. Don't do that. 
Ah, the fun of dogs. They d dags. They do whatever they want, whenever they want. And right now, he really wants to be part of the show, which you always are, buddy. You always are. Who's your good boy? All right, we're going to be talking about some dogs, some very faithful hunting dogs in just a couple minutes uh, when we get to our sunset. Now, the sun will always rise in the east and set in the west, so that's how you can start to figure your way around the sky. We are facing south. We actually do have an S at the bottom of the screen there. Hopefully you can see it, uh, depending on the size of your screen, of course, which means north is behind us. I will kind of advise you when we turn around. Uh, things will look a little bit different. Of course, you're looking at this on a square screen, either on your TV or your computer or your tablet, maybe your phone, depending on where you are or how you are observing us. The sky, of course, will look very different when you go outside in the sense of things will be a lot further apart. But we're going to try to give you the tools so that you yourself can go outside tonight or any night and be able to actually see some of these objects. We're going to talk about some constellations. We're going to talk about some planets. Uh, the moon, unfortunately, is not going to be visible tonight, but we'll talk about the moon anyway. And uh, <laughs> he's biting my hand. Good Lord. Come on. Come on, buddy. Let go. I need, I need my hand so I can do the show. All right, so the sun is almost set in the western sky. Now, the sunset... <laughs> Growly puppy. The sunset, of course, is dependent on where you are. Uh, the further north you are, so the further you are from the equator, the later the sun will likely set for you. Come here, buddy. Please do not bite the microphone. Why do you do this now? There we go. We now have sunset. And for us tonight, at least where I'm at, it's just after 5.40 p.m. Uh, so again, it might be a little bit later for you. It just depends on where you are. Now, this is always an interesting time. Right at sunset, you will see planets. Now... What is a planet? Let's start with that. There are eight planets in the solar system. Usually we like to say nine, but it's no longer true. It's eight. Uh, Pluto was demoted. It is no longer a planet. It is now what's called a dwarf planet. So I'm so sorry, Pluto. But we are going to talk about the planets. The word planet comes from the phrase planetis. It's a Greek phrase. I'm probably pronouncing it completely wrong. It means wanderer or vagabond. And ancient astronomers noticed that there were seven objects that traveled through the sky. You had the sun and the, what we call the sun and the moon today. Uh, they were considered planets long ago. Well, obviously, we don't consider them planets today. And then there were five other objects, including... Mercury, what we now call Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those round out the seven classical planets, we call them. It's also kind of related to the seven days of the week. Each day of the week is named after a different one of these classical planets. So the sun, Sunday. The moon, Monday. Tuesday is Mars. Wednesday is Mercury. Thursday is Jupiter. And Friday is for Venus, Saturn. Saturday. Let's, uh, let's see what we got going on here. Now, right at sunset, it's easiest time, or at sunrise even, you will see the planets when they appear in the sky, because they're the only things that are going to be reflecting light through the atmosphere and making it nice and easy. We're going to zoom in here really, really close to the edge of the horizon. So now the horizon looks flat. It's not a flat planet. It's just a flat horizon from our point of view. And you're going to see that there's actually going to be three planets close to the horizon, and, and the moon is going to be out in reality. Not really. Uh, you can't really see the moon, but this is where it's at. It's only going to be out briefly. In a row... Tonight, you will see three planets in a nice line. From the horizon going upwards, you've got Saturn, 
Jupiter, and then Mercury. Mercury's just recently added itself to the sky. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn have been trekking across the sky for the last few months. Uh, last month we had the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, and so they were pretty close together that evening in December, I believe it was the 21st. They're now slightly spread apart, and Mercury has slowly been rising up, actually rapidly been rising up, and it'll only be out for another week and a half or so. So if you get a chance, go out there and look at them. Now, we're going to look at these up close in a little bit. But uh, let's talk about them. Again, if you have any questions, type it in chat. Stop me. Uh, I'm more than happy to take a look at whatever you want to talk about. Let's start with Saturn because it's the one lowest of the horizon. Again, you'll notice that with the atmosphere, you don't see it all that clear. Let's get rid of the atmosphere if we can. Oh, it gets rid of the planet too. Wonderful. That's not what we wanted. Here we see the planet Saturn through the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Saturn is the ringed giant, people like to call it. However, it is not the only planet with rings. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the outer planets, the gas giant planets, they have rings. Saturn's rings, however, are the only ones you can see with a telescope from the planet Earth. Beautiful ring system. You do see what's called the Cassini division, the huge, this darkened ring out here. And you also see what is called the Enki gap, this little line way on the edge of the rings. Now, there are two really important moons, satellites orbiting around the planet Saturn. One is called Titan. It's the only, it's way over here, actually. Uh, Titan's the only moon in the whole solar system that has an atmosphere. Uh, an atmosphere made of uh, methane, of all things. There's also a little ice moon named Enceladus. Now, Enceladus, sitting right down here, uh, Enceladus is actually an icy moon with liquid water under its surface. It has geysers spitting water out into space. If there's water, is there life? That is always the huge question. A question that we don't have an answer to. Zooming back in, we'll look at Jupiter now. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. Uh, it is also named after the king of the gods in Roman mythology. Zeus in Greek, Jupiter in Roman. Around Jupiter, when you look through a telescope, you will see four satellites. Now, sometimes... They'll either be, you know, they might be behind the planet, so you might not be able to see them. So maybe you only see three. But there are four what we call the Galilean moons or the Galilean satellites. I mean, for Galileo Galilei, uh, we've got Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. And it looks like tonight Europa and Io are going to be very, very close together. Uh, zooming in on Jupiter itself, you are looking at the upper atmosphere of the planet and you see the great red spot. So if you have a telescope tonight and you look at Jupiter, you're going to see the Great Red Spot. This is a huge hurricane-like storm, but you must understand the grandiose size of this. When you think of a hurricane, maybe you think of a hurricane the size of, let's say, the state of Florida, which gets hit by hurricanes fairly often. This particular hurricane is about three times the size of our whole entire planet. Three to four times the size of the planet Earth. So this thing is huge. This planet is huge. It reflects a huge amount of sunlight back, and that's why it's very, very bright. Of these three planets in the western sky tonight, it will be the brightest of the three. Not as bright will be Mercury, even though Mercury is much closer to us. It's just not very big. Mercury is a ball of rock. It's been battered and bruised over the millennia. Uh, we'll look at Mercury up close in a different software package in just a little bit. It is the closest planet to the Sun, which makes it very elusive. It's not visible for very long. Mercury and Venus, because they're closer to the Sun than the Earth is, you're only going to be able to see them in the morning or in the evening. Right now, uh, Venus is leaving our sky, so we won't be able to see it. Uh, but Mercury is going to be visible for the next oh, two and a half weeks or so uh, in the evening sky. So... You really want to look for it uh, right around sunset. It goes away very, very fast. Uh, 
There is another planet out tonight, though. It's the planet Mars. Uh, this is the red planet. We're going to go ahead and let the sun continue to set. Uh, Mars is directly in the southern sky, so let's zoom back out a little bit and look at all the satellites flying by. And now we have a little bit more darkness, which makes Mars even easier to see. Uranus is also in the sky, but you cannot see it without a telescope. Mars, however, will have a very distinct reddish orange glow. It'll be the brightest thing in the sky, southern sky right at sunset. And throughout the evening, you'll see it trekking from south all the way towards the west. Now, Mars will be in the news again very, very shortly. In just a few weeks, on the 18th of February, a new Mars rover will be heading in for landing. Uh, that is Mars Perseverance. Uh, we're hoping it will land safely. It's not easy to land on the planet Mars. Here we see Mars up close and personal. Uh, Mars does have a very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere does have frozen ice caps made of dry ice, carbon dioxide ice at the North and South Pole. And on its surface, we don't see any liquid water, but we see evidence that there may have been water there in the past. If you were to look at Mars through a telescope tonight that was powerful enough to zoom in this well, uh, you would see this region right here. This is called Valles Marineris, Mariner Valley. Uh, it's five times deeper than the Grand Canyon, so it's... About five miles, so that's so oh, somewhere around 10, 11 kilometers deep, somewhere in there. And if you were to place it on a map of the United States, it would go from San Francisco all the way to New York City. So it's as wide as the United States. It's a huge, huge crack. In the surface of the planet, there are two moons orbiting around Mars, Phobos and Deimos, fear and panic, all orbiting around the god of war. <laughs> So they are aptly named. Now, again, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Ask them in chat. I will do my best to answer them. Let's zoom back out and talk about the sky itself real fast. And to do that, we're going to zoom back out a little bit more and look kind of overall, as if we're laying down on the grass and kind of looking straight up. Now... Our sky no longer looks like this if you're in a city. Remember, long ago, there was no city lights. There, you know, people would sit around fires and talk about the sky. There is a thing called light pollution. As our cities have become more and more dense, so have the lights of our city. And so for most people, your night sky probably looks something more like this. You don't see a lot of faint stars. You only see the brightest stars in the sky, and that's okay. We're going to be talking about some really bright stars and some bright, easily found constellations. But if you really want to see the sky the way it's meant to be seen, you have to get away from the city lights, and you have to get to a place where you don't have a lot of light pollution. So you want to get out into the suburbs or even out further, uh, find a campground, which most of them are closed right now, unfortunately. So that makes it kind of hard. That's what we're doing, Planetarium Show. We're going to teach you all these things so when we're finally able to go travel around and go out to do camping or just go fishing or whatever, uh, you'll be able to see the sky the way it's meant to be seen and understand what you're actually looking at. So we have all these stars in the sky. Different stories were created for these different star patterns. Now, the star patterns are often called constellations. Now, there are two different styles, and this is going to be kind of complicated to understand. There are official constellations. There's 88 of them in the sky. And if we were to connect all the dots, it would look something like this. These are the constellations in the sky. They were gods and goddesses, and pri uh, priestesses, queens, kings, deities, creatures, snakes, hydras, fish, horses, unicorns, rabbits, dogs, bears. They all have their own stories. We could be here for weeks if we try to talk about all of them. Now, these are the official constellations of the nighttime sky. There's 88 of them total if you combine the north and the south. Because uh, in Australia and places south of the equator, they have different constellations altogether. But this is Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Arab-based constellations. There are actually 
totally different what we call sky stories or star lore. Uh, let's look at the sky again. We're going to change the star lore from what we normally use to Chinese. Same exact sky, totally different shapes, totally different constellations. Now, some of these are incomplete, unfortunately, like this only has a couple, but there are some labels in the sky. Uh, this is Inuit. Uh, this is Navajo. So this is some of the Navajo sky. I wish this was complete, because I know there are more. Uh, Tongan, I think, only has a couple up there. Yeah. So some of these are incomplete, but there are many, many different... This is Sami. They have an interesting constellation hanging out up here. But again, different parts of the world, different ways of looking at the exact same sky, and that's what I always find interesting. Astronomy can lead you to many different things. You can study anthropology. You can study history. You can study other cultures. You can study math, of course, and chemistry. Biology, astrobiology is a thing. It leads you to a lot, of, a lot of different subjects. You can also become a better artist. You can paint things based around astronomy, you can write stories, you can make songs. Whatever you want to do. Now, some of these groupings of stars have subgroupings. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are different shapes in the sky that are not official constellations. Possibly the easiest one, the one that a lot of people know about, called the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is not a constellation. The Big Dipper, which we're not going to look at just yet, we'll look at it in just a little bit. Uh, the Big Dipper is what's called an asterism. An asterism is an easy-to-find shape that helps you find your way around the sky, or maybe it uh, you know, shows you certain bright stars in the sky. But it itself... Come on, buddy. It itself is not a constellation. My dog is chewing on my guitar. That's terrible. What are you doing, dude? Now, there are a group of constellations that are very particular, and a lot of people know about them because they are called the Zodiac. These 12 constellations, long ago, were used for divination and, you know, figuring out your future and things like that. That's astrology. Astronomy is studying how the things actually move around and how they form. It's astrophysics. But... These 12 constellations follow a very particular path. That path is the path the sun and the moon and all the planets that we've talked about so far and all the planets we haven't talked about so far. Uh, all the planets of our solar system travel this plane of the ecliptic, as it's called. This is the zodiac. It shows you where the sun is in the sky throughout the year. Now, the real question becomes, why? Why is it a flat plane from our point of view? To get a better understanding of that, let's switch over to our other software. This is more of a 3D looking software. And this is Universe Sandbox. There we go. So, we're going to look at the solar system from a three-dimensional point of view. Here we've got the sun hanging out in the middle of our solar system. Ball of plasma and gases fusing hydrogen into helium. It looks really, really bright because we're close to it. Uh, then we'll zoom out and take a look at everything. So we got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the first four orbits, the first four planets of our solar system. We call these the Earth-like, or terrestrial planets, Terra meaning Earth. Uh, then you have a group of small objects called asteroids. They are rocky. Some of them are rounded. Some of them are just kind of jaggedly shaped. Uh, leftover debris from the early solar system. Then you have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the outer planets of our solar system. And then you have what are called trans-Neptunian objects. These are objects that are out very, very far from the sun. They are out past the planet Neptune. And these are the realm in the realm of the comets. These are all very, very frozen objects at the edge of our solar system. Now... If we rotate this all and look at it again, you notice something very interesting. All the planets happen to be on a flat plane. However, 
Pluto and some of these outer trans-Neptunian objects are a little bit off-kilter there. It's actually part of the reason why they're not considered planets. This is the plane of the ecliptic. This is the zodiac. It just shows you where the sun, the moon, and the planets are from our point of view. Uh, you'll notice in the background we do have the Milky Way, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. As we zoom away from our sun, you'll notice the sun is not all that bright compared to this grandiose object in the background. That is the Milky Way galaxy. We will talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, during our summer months, our orbit places us looking towards the core of our galaxy, this heart to the galaxy in the background there. During the winter months, we look along the edge of our Milky Way. So the sky looks a little bit different. Anyway, let's take a look at some of these planets up close. We talked about Mercury a little bit ago. There we are. Mercury again looks like a very battered rock floating around the sun. Very, very hot, very, very close to the sun. Hasn't really been investigated all that much because it's really difficult to get to. Very few orbiters have gone to the planet Mercury. Uh, let's see, speaking of very few orbiters, the planet Venus has only had a couple of visitors on its surface, and they all melted very promptly. Venus has an atmosphere made of carbon dioxide primarily, and it uh, traps in a lot of heat. Uh, you don't see the surface of the planet. If you could, you'd see it traveling in a very strange direction. For us, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. On Venus, it's the opposite. It rises in the west and sets in the east. Very, very slow orbit. I'm sorry, very slow rotation on its axis. A day on Venus, about the length of its year, give or take. Uh, so over 224 days. Very, very strange planet. Uh, some people call it Earth's evil twin. Uh, it is about the size of our planet Earth. A little bit smaller, but it has a lot of differences. One huge difference is it doesn't support life. Whoa, let's slow that down. Here we are looking at our planet Earth, and you see the Earth at night. Remember, we just talked about light pollution, and this is actually the result of it. You can clearly see uh, major cities of our planet Earth uh, just by looking. There's Cairo and the Nile River, there's Spain, there's Madrid, there's London. There's the eastern seaboard. Anywhere you see lots of bright lights, that's not the best place to view the sky. But it is where humans are concentrated. This is the Earth at night. There's Tokyo, Beijing, Shanghai. Always cool to see, but got to keep it in context. Light pollution takes away our chance to be one with the stars. And we visit the planet Mars, which we talked about a little bit ago. There's... Actually, let's see. Can I pause it? Yes. Uh, there's Velus Marineris, which we looked at. That will be visible tonight through a telescope. Huge crack along the surface. It's likely Mars cooled at some point in the past. No longer has lava under its surface. Uh, so when the planet rapidly cooled, it may have cracked. There's also this interesting region of Mars called Tharsis. Tharsis has three shield volcanoes. And then this huge volcano up here called Olympus Mons. Mount Olympus. Oh, the song's going to do its thing. There's that weird, uh, and I don't know why. Uh, I didn't write it. It just is a song in the background. Now, this volcano, if you've ever seen a map of the United States, there's the Four Corners region, which is New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah. This one single volcano would fit entirely in any of those states. This would cover up the entire state of New Mexico. It would cover up the entire state of Utah or Colorado or Arizona. Just one single volcano. It is huge. It's a giant pimple on the planet Mars. Largest volcano in the solar system. Uh, so those are the inner planets. Uh, we're going to look at the outer planets briefly, uh, mostly because they're not really well done in this software, and I don't know why. Uh, here's the gas giant Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter has what's called differential rotation, which means the equator actually spins faster than the north or south pole. All the gas giants do that. Uh, the sun does it as well. Now, you do see the great red spot occasionally popping up here. I don't know. It's just, it just looks weird. 
There's the great red spot. It's missing a bunch of the little pearls. There's actually a lot of little white white colored clouds uh, and little storms. We call them the pearls of Jupiter, uh, but they are not in this simulation. Even worse is when we look at Saturn. I, I, I don't understand why, but we're gonna go with it. Saturn, for whatever reason, doesn't have any rings in this simulation. And that pretty much kills the whole point of looking at the planet Saturn. <laughs> Uh, there are actually clouds on Saturn that do change, and, and you get lots of little storms. It's actually a really interesting storm. Uh, looks like a hexagon at the north pole of the planet. But, uh, yeah, without the rings, this it's, it just looks... I don't know. <laughs> Ignore it! Let's head over to Uranus. Now, Uranus, as we've mentioned, is a planet that does have rings. Mm, all the gas giants do, but you don't see them from the planet Earth. Now, Uranus is one of these weird planets that we don't really know a lot about because we don't really send probes to it. We do a lot of probes to Jupiter and a lot of probes to Saturn. Uranus and Neptune are both very, very far away, so they're hard to get to. And it takes a long time to get there. But we don't seem to send many probes, and I don't know why. Now, with Uranus, this planet is also an oddball. When you look at it, the picture of the planet Earth, you know, the, the the globe has north up top and south on the bottom. Uh, it's not the way it is with Uranus. Uranus has a north pole right here and a south pole back here. It's tipped over on its side. So take, you know, close up a water bottle and have it sitting there and you have north and south, so to speak. Tip it over on its side. That's how this planet orbits around the sun. We don't know why. It's one of the mysteries of our solar system. Uh, Neptune is way over here. Neptune is named after the god of the sea, Poseidon, or Neptune. It is blue in color. Now, weirdly, it has a bunch of atmospheric disturbances. It has clouds that are in storm-like fashion moving around. So you, something like the great red spot, but dark. Call it the great dark spot. It shouldn't be there. Not because we don't want it there, but because it shouldn't be there. There's not enough sunlight, there's not enough heat to heat up the planet for that to be happening. So something's heating the planet from the inside. One hypothesis is that the planet Neptune is slightly shrinking. And that shrinking causes pressure, pressure causes temperature, temperature causes clouds to do fun cloud-like things. So there's our solar system from afar. If you have any questions, again, stop me at any point, type them in the chat. We will come back to this software a little bit later. Let's go back to our planetarium software. Hello, viewers. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You've missed us talking about the solar system. We're now going to do some general astronomy, kind of finding our way around the sky. Glad you could join us wherever you happen to be. Now, one of the coolest parts about the winter sky in North America, again, it's summertime in Australia and everywhere south of the equator, but it's wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where I live, so I tend to talk mostly about this. Uh, the Northern Hemisphere, the winter sky, has a lot of very bright stars, and it makes them really easy to find, and it makes it really easy to find your way around the sky. We've advanced the sky a little bit more. It's now around 8, 8.30 p.m. If you go outside, uh, safe again, safely, so you want to dress up for the temperature that you're in, you want to make sure you're in a safe place. If you have a backyard or a front yard looking east, that's great. Uh, if there's a park nearby, maybe go to it as long as it's open. Don't, don't break any laws or anything. Stay socially distanced, all that good stuff. If you go outside around 8.30 tonight, this is what you're going to see in the east-southeast part of the sky. Now, you will be able to see really, really bright stars. Even in the middle of cities, they just won't look as bright. In particular, you're going to be able to see possibly the most famous constellation of them all. And it is a constellation called... Orion, the Great Hunter. Many songs written after, you know, with the name Orion. People named their kids Orion. 
Orion the Great Hunter is one of the easiest constellations to find in the nighttime sky, because it's made of very, very bright stars. It has an asterism right along the middle of it, and it's called Orion's Belt. There's three stars in a line. That's it. That's the belt of Orion. If you can find that, you're going to be able to find, one, Orion, two, about five other constellations. And we're going to go through that right now. Ready? Let's take a look. So, the stars of Orion do have names, and some of these you may have heard before. Uh, his shoulder star is named Betelgeuse, or Betelgeese. I've heard it pronounced that way. I don't think that's right. I think it's actually Betelgeuse. Uh, Betelgeuse is the brightest star, second brightest star in Orion. It's this bright reddish orange shoulder star up here. Uh, the opposite star is named Bellatrix. That is the other shoulder star. Where's my little line drawing thing? There we go. So Betelgeuse to Bellatrix. There's the shoulders. Uh, you go down this way, you find Rigel. That is the knee star. Now, you will notice that these stars are very, very different in color. Bellatrix is kind of a light blue. Rigel is very blue, almost bluish white. Betelgeuse is very red reddish orange and then the last of the stars of orion on here is called safe or Sife, right down there like that there's the outer portion of orion those are the four outer stars and then you've got alnitak alnilam and mintaka the three belt stars right down the middle they all have very different colors but most of them are going to be bright blue except for the shoulder star what does that actually mean why does it matter well when you think about stars you're looking at a couple of different things. One, you're looking at their temperature based on their color, and you can likely tell their age by their color as well. Red stars tend to be colder. Now, cold is relative. We're using the sun as the middle point. So the sun is our average star, yellow, kind of an average temperature, about 6,000 degrees Celsius on its surface, give or take. Red stars are going to be colder than the sun. Still deadly for us humans, but colder when it comes to stars. Blue stars, white stars, are going to be very, very hot. Much hotter than the sun. And you see that very, very prevalently in these stars of Orion. Let's find our way around the sky using these beautiful... Uh, four, five, six, seven stars, we'll call it. Yeah, we'll use these seven stars. There's actually a little bit more. There's more stars up front making a shield. Uh, sometimes it's a shield. Sometimes it's a lion pelt. Uh, some stories have Orion carrying an unbreakable club, and uh, some of them have him being kind of a, the omnipotent hunter. He wants to kill everything, every animal. He wants to kill one of every animal on the planet. And so he was punished and placed in the sky. Uh, other ones have him, uh, you know, he was the he was the love of the goddess of the moon, uh, Artemis, and uh, her brother Apollo, the sun god. Uh, he was not too pleased with that, and he made a challenge to his sister, said, hey, how about you hit this really, really distant object? She didn't know that that distant object was actually Orion, and she shot him with an arrow, killed him, and felt so bad she placed him up in the sky for all of eternity so he's always seen there's lots of different stories about the sky about these different constellations uh it, with orion there's many 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 constellation stories uh one of the things is that he may be hunting or fighting a bull in the sky or he's looking for seven beautiful maidens and they are actually the first thing we're going to use uh, first thing we're going to find using the belt of Orion. Let's go ahead and use Orion's belt. We'll draw the line through them. Three stars in a line. Keep going towards the west. Just draw a line straight through. That's all you got to do. If you can draw a straight line through these three stars, you're going to find the next constellation we're going to talk about real fast. This is the bull in the sky. This is Taurus, the bull. This is one of those zodiac constellations. The bright V of stars making up his face. They are called the Hyades. They are the face of the bull. It is a open star cluster. It's a group of stars that likely form together but kind of spread apart over time. The eye of the bull is a reddish orange colored star named Al. Debaron. It's kind of like Betelgeuse. It's a red giant star. It's a star nearing the end of its lifetime, and so it puffs up really, really, really big. We'll look at how, st how star sizes are in just a little bit, I promise. Remember the maidens? Well, the, the, the maidens that I just mentioned are these seven stars right over here. There's actually more than just seven. Uh, this is actually the Pleiades, or the Pleiades. 
the seven sisters, Subaru, whatever you want to call them. Uh, this is what they look like when you zoom in up close. This star right here is Merope, and you've got Electra and Asterope and Alcyone. That's that's the star. That's the star our cat's named after right there. Pretty cool. Yeah, we're those nerds. It's okay. You can be a nerd. Being a nerd is quite all right. So the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, and Taurus the Bull are both visible tonight. As long as there's no clouds and there's no buildings in the way, you should see them if you can find Orion. What else can we find with Orion? Well, what about a set of twins? These are the Gemini twins of the Zodiac, Castor and Pollux. How do you find them? Well, let's go back to our friend Orion and go to Rigel. Remember, Rigel's his knee star. Draw a line through Rigel and Beetlejuice and keep going. You won't end up directly at them, but you'll end up really, really close by. There's two parallel stars right up here. Let's actually turn the planetarium a little bit and zoom in. You see these two parallel stars. They are slightly different colored. One's a little bit more blue than the other. These are the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux. They again hang out just above Orion, right over here. So that's the next constellation we've already found with Orion. Just below Orion, there's a bunny rabbit. Now, the bunny rabbit, Lepus the Hare, is actually kind of difficult to see, even in good conditions. There's not a lot of bright stars in it, and it's kind of hard to actually, you know, put together the bunny. But it is there. If you can find the belt of Orion, just draw a line straight down from the middle star and you end up kind of near this weird little square of stars. That's the body of the bunny, and his head comes out up front, and he's got little bunny ears. Again, it's it's kind of a strange constellation, but it is there that is Lepus the Hare, straight below Orion. More importantly, we can, oh God, stop that. There we go. More importantly, we can find Orion's two hunting dogs. Now, this group of stars that we're going to talk about next, they are not a constellation. We're going to talk about what's called the Winter Triangle. The Winter Triangle, as it sounds, as it's named, is only visible in the winter and is a group of three stars. Convenient. We'll start off with Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, the shoulder star of Orion, right up here. Draw a line straight towards the horizon around 8.30 tonight, and you will see a very, very bright star. It will be twinkling rapidly, and it will be very bright, very blue in color. This is the star called Sirius. Yep, that's your star, buddy. Sirius, the dog star. Seriously, it's really, really bright. It's the brightest star you see in the nighttime sky. It is the heart of the... Big dog, Canis Major, the big hunting dog of Orion there. To find the next star of our triangle, so we've got Betelgeuse and then Sirius. Uh, to find the next star, we need to draw that line again, stop in the middle, and then head towards the east. This takes us to a star named Procyon. This is actually the original name of our puppy. Then we changed it. Procyon is the brightest star in the constellation Canis Minor, the little dog. Now, this little dog has but two stars in it. So it's really a hot dog, or a dachshund for that matter. That's how you find Orion's two hunting dogs. We found one, two, three, four constellations just with Orion. And if you include Orion, five constellations. You now know, if you didn't know them before, you now know five constellations more than you did when we started. That's pretty cool, isn't it? All because we're able to pick out three stars in a belt. Also of interest, if you have a telescope or a set of binoculars, you can see something really, really cool. A stellar nursery. What do I mean by that? It's an area where baby stars are being born. Little baby stars. Where do we find this? Well, let's go back to Orion's belt. And then we're going to go straight below the middle star. If you have a small telescope, it'll look like a little fuzzball. 
Binoculars look like a little fuzzball. This little thing right here, when you zoom in, actually is much, much more intriguing than you'd ever think. This is the Great Nebula in Orion. It is a kind of a cone shape, so like put your hands if you can. Uh, put your hands together, put your palms together, and put your pinky and your thumb together. And make kind of like a little cup, like you're trying to hold water. But now tilt it to the side. That's kind of what's going on here. You've got a cocoon, a cloud, that's slowly being blown open by the heat and pressure of... It's actually a little group of stars. They call them the trapezium. There's four stars really, really brightly in the middle. This entire area is glowing like a neon bulb. The, the gases are actually being heated up. They're illuminating the area around them. This is a stellar nursery. Stars are being born here. It's like Hollywood. Stars are being born. There's also other cool things. There's what's called the Running Man. It's kind of blurry here, unfortunately. I apologize, but it looks like a, a dude jumping over a star. That's the Running Man Nebula uh, very nearby. Uh, kind of unfortunate that it's not Halloween, but there's also what's called the Witch's Head Nebula near Rigel. There's the Witch's Head Nebula. Let's zoom back out. Uh, let's go back to Alnitak. Now, Alnitak is one of the three stars of Orion's belt. Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mitaka. Next to this star, you have a really intriguing scene. You've got what's called a Reflection Nebula, this blue cloud. It's actually light diffracting off dust and gas and space, kind of like our sky turns blue. It's the same idea. There's a star, and its light is filtering through a cloud between us and it. There's also this dark nebula. This one, people call it the Horse's Head Nebula. Looks like a horse's head. Kind of looks like a scorpion's tail, to be honest, but people call it the Horse's Head Nebula. There we go. The bright red cloud you see is actually illuminated. It's actually glowing in space. It's heated up by some of these stars. Much like the Orion Nebula, there's something going on here. There's a star-forming region right here. This cloud is also being illuminated. It's just not opened up yet. We don't see the stars that are causing this to glow. There's a lot of other things going on in deep space all around here. And it's all just around Orion. So Orion's a really, really rich place to look in the nighttime sky. Especially now, during the late winter in the Northern Hemisphere. We're going to go ahead and turn around and take a look towards the north. It's now again 8.45. It used to be 8.30, now it's 8.45 p.m. in our planetarium. We're going to do some quick sighting of the North Star before we keep going. The North Star is something that's always good to find because, well, if you can find the North Star, do you know you're facing north and you can always find your way around. To find it, there are two groupings of stars you want to use. One is a constellation. One is an asterism. The constellation is actually up here. During the winter months, Cassiopeia is her name. She is a three or a W shape. She's a beautiful queen who's being punished and stuck to her chair for all of eternity. Sometimes she's upside down and not very queen-like. Uh, other times she's right side up. She is opposite of what is called Ursa Major, the Big Bear. The Big Bear is right over here. But more importantly, the Big Bear has a group of seven stars inside of it, an asterism that we call the Big Dipper. A lot of people can find the Big Dipper, but they can't really see the rest of the bear, and that's okay. If you can find either of these two shapes in the sky, two triangles making Cassiopeia, or the Big Dipper, three stars of a tail and four stars of a cup, uh, you can actually find the North Star. And I'm going to show you how to do it right now. We're going to start off, again, this is almost 9 o'clock now in our planetarium. We're going to start off with our Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is three stars, one, two, three making a tail, and then we connect to one, two, three, four stars making a cup. So it's like a big soup ladle in the sky. These last two stars, we call them the pointer stars. They point to Polaris. Polaris is the pole star, the north star, the lodestar. This is the north star. 
contrary to popular belief, it is not the brightest star in the sky. It just happens to be in a good spot. And that spot is above the horizon in a place where it never goes below the horizon at all. What do I mean by that? If you watch, stars will rise and set, but Polaris basically sits in the same part of the sky. Now, let's make sure we're pointing at Polaris. How do we do that? Well, we pointed this way, we pointed to Polaris. The other way of doing it is to find, again, Cassiopeia. Remember, there's two triangles. There's triangle number one, and then there's this equal-sided triangle in the sky. This triangle, draw a line right down the middle of it. <laughs> Same exact spot. That is the pole star. Now, the pole star is the tail of the Little Dipper. The Little Dipper is a constellation, and that's why I say it is kind of confusing. The Big Dipper is not a constellation. The Big Dipper is part of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. The Little Dipper basically makes up the entire Little Bear. <laughs> so one's a constellation, one isn't. I don't make the rules. I'm just telling you what I learned. Around both the Dippers is a constellation called Draco the Dragon. Now, in Draco the Dragon, there is a star named Thuban. It's not all that important of a star to be able to find, but the reason I mention it is that Thuban used to be the North Star. And what do I mean by that? Well, long ago, the North Pole of our planet Earth used to point in this direction. And now it's traversed all the way this way and is pointing towards the North Star that we call the North Star today. And then eventually it will rotate around and point back this direction. There's actually precession. It's about 26,000 years for this to happen. Nonetheless, let's keep watching as the stars rise and set. I'm actually going to get rid of the atmosphere so the sun will not... Uh, change the brightness here and you can see the stars will rise and set but polaris the pole star the north star just sits in the same part of the sky now depending on where you are this may or may not be this high in the sky what do i mean by that well remember my planetarium is set up for where i happen to live where you happen to live may be slightly differently where i live the North Star is about 35 degrees above the horizon. If you live north of where I live, and what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you live in Toronto. Toronto is a city in Canada, and it's much, much more north than I am here in New Mexico. Notice, my line is still here, but the North Star is even higher. Instead of being 35 degrees, it's now... 42 degrees above the horizon. What about if we lived in, I don't know, Alaska somewhere? Let's say Juneau. Juneau, Alaska. Well, look at that. It's even higher. It's now 57 degrees above the horizon. So all of this depends on where you live. So always make sure you check your star charts so that uh, you get a good, authentic view of the sky so we did a little astronomy stuff you know visual astronomy finding your way around uh let's see there's actually one other thing i want to talk about in the northern part of the sky but i do need to get back to where we were this looks weird uh back to default there we go much better there's the sky that i'm used to there is one other object i want you to be able to find tonight and that object is something that's called the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, a galaxy we're going to talk about next. We're going to be talking about deep space stuff. So stars, star sizes, and then we're going to talk about galaxies, okay? Galaxies are groupings of stars and gas and dust. Everything you see at night in our sky is part of the Milky Way galaxy. That is our home galaxy. Now... There is another galaxy. There's many, many galaxies at night, but there's one galaxy you can actually find without using a telescope if you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's two ways of finding it. We need to find either Cassiopeia, which we've used before. This is that three shape that we just used to find the North Star. Or you can find a great horse. Now, when you think of a horse, what do you think of? Precisely, a square. No? No? Okay, maybe it's just me. In reality, this is just what people somehow saw in the sky. There is a grouping of four stars. 
four stars making a square. We call it the Great Square of Pegasus. Now, Pegasus was the great winged flying horse of mythology. Why he's made of a square, I don't know. But there he is, the great flying horse, big square in the sky. Connecting to this last star up here, you will find a much smaller constellation, a thinner constellation. This thing looks like an A in the sky. This is Andromeda. This is Cassiopeia's daughter. If you can find the Pegasus constellation, you can find Andromeda. If you can find the Andromeda constellation, you can find the Andromeda galaxy. You can use Cassiopeia, this triangle that we used before, the equal-sided triangle. Draw a line through the middle towards the point and keep going. You will find the Andromeda galaxy. You can pinpoint it by going back and finding the Andromeda constellation. Remember, it looks like an A in the sky. If you just count to three, you will find it. So one, two, three stars. One, two, three stars. Connect the last ones. One, two, three stars. And just off that last star, you will find the Andromeda galaxy for a very long time. This was called the Andromeda Nebula. Through a telescope, it looks like a little fuzzball. And most of the time we see a fuzzball, it's probably going to be a nebula. However, when technology advanced and we had cameras that could take long exposures, it was revealed that it was this beautiful spiral galaxy. This is one of the many shapes that galaxies can take. Galaxies can be elliptical, like this one down here, so it looks like a little football in space, or they can be spiral in shape, like the Andromeda Galaxy. Our own Milky Way is spiral. There's also what are called irregular galaxies, which don't fit any of those particular molds. I see somebody. Hello. Hello, world. Yes, chat. Hello, world. Indeed. We're actually going to be looking at the world here in just a second, because we're going to back out, talk about stars, and then talk about galaxies, because that was the plan. Let's switch software here. There we go. So here we are. Once again, welcome to our planetarium show, friend, wherever you happen to be. Uh, so there we are, looking at our Earth once again from above. But you see the sun in the background. Now, the sun is our star and it is considered a yellow dwarf. It does look bright to us because of where we are. We're pretty close to it. But let's look at things on the grand scale. So let's actually make a new simulation. So let's empty everything out. No planets, no nothing. We are now just in the void of space. Let's add some stars, shall we? Here's our sun. Whew, looks really bright. Looks really big, right? Well, not really. I hope you'll be famous on Twitch. I hope so too, man. I'm just here to teach people. Appreciate you being here. Share it around. We do this every Monday and Wednesday. Uh, Fridays we do more news-related stuff, but uh, we do astronomy stuff on Mondays and Wednesdays. And feel free to ask questions throughout the show. I'm happy to answer them as best I can. Let's take a look at some of the stars we talked about. We talked about Rigel. Rigel was one of the knee stars of Orion. Look at how much bigger Rigel is compared to the sun. This is the sun right here. Look at Rigel, way bigger. But that's not all. Stars get even bigger than this. We're gonna put some blue stars. Let's see, Spica is a star that we see in the summertime. Uh, you can see it's bright and blue, but it's not as big as Rigel. What else do we have? Let's see here. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Uh, we talked about Betelgeuse, one of Orion's stars, the shoulder star of Orion, right? Well, take a look at that. Look at how much bigger... Okay, there's the sun, okay? Here's the sun. This is our star. This is our sun. Look at how much bigger Betelgeuse is compared to the sun. This space right here where Betelgeuse is sitting, that takes up everything from the Sun to Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, all the way out almost to the planet Jupiter. Just one star. When stars near the end of their lifetime, they start to puff up. And they get colder. They can't keep their equilibrium, and they turn into what we call a red giant star. 
Some of them can explode violently. That's called a supernova. Other ones, they just kind of die quietly and they puff out their outer layers. Uh, they become what's called a planetary nebula. Let's put some more red giants. So there's Antares, which is actually slightly bigger than Betelgeuse, as you can see here. So you can see really quickly, like, stars can get really, really, really big. And if you're a planet around one of these stars that has decided to get much larger and puff up, well, probably not a good sign. There's Deneb. This is a star you see during the summer months. Again, blue star, hotter, likely younger than the sun. Very young compared to the sun. Uh, the sun is about 10 billion years old. 10 billion years left in its fuel tank. Blue stars do not live very long. They do explode violently. They live by the live fast, die young uh, philosophy. Uh, redder colored stars, they tend to live a lot longer. Uh, they burn colder. They burn slower, so to speak. They don't burn in the sense of fire. They do fuse hydrogen into helium, but these are all stars. I'm just kind of putting up different ones. There's Procyon, and as you can see, Procyon's actually pretty small, but it is fairly bright in our sky, which means it's likely closer than all the other objects that we talked about. So there's a good look at stars. Now, if you collect all the stars together, you make what we call star cluster. And there's different kinds. There's open star cluster. There's globular cluster. But overall, they become part of what is called a galaxy. Our galaxy, we call the Milky Way. Our Milky Way galaxy is considered to be a spiral galaxy. Now, there's different kinds of galaxies out there. We mentioned that a little bit before. And each galaxy, there's actually even sub subsects of galaxies, subsets of galaxies. Uh, the spiral like this, some of them are actually called barred spirals. They have a weird horizontal bar through the middle of them. Our star, the sun, is likely out on one of these outer arms of the spiral galaxy that we call the Milky Way. From our point of view, when we look at the nighttime sky, this, the Milky Way looks like this. We're not really sure what it looks like because we can't see it from above. We see it from the edge because we're in one of the edges. And much like pizza, when you take dough and spin it around, it flattens out centripetal force. Same thing happened with the solar system. Same thing happens with galaxies. They tend to flatten out like this if they're in a spiral configuration. Now, there are some stars kind of going through the middle there. In the middle of the galaxy, there's what's called a supermassive black hole. It's a huge black hole, an area of space that not even light can escape it. So we can't really directly see it, but we can see what's going on around it. And what we see is a lot of stars orbiting very, very, very fast around this black hole. Now, I want you to use your brain and think. Imagine if you were on, you'll notice there are some stars that are above or below. Imagine if you lived around a planet, uh, on a planet that was around one of these stars. That means at night, when you looked up at night, instead of just seeing a couple of stars kind of splattered throughout the sky, you would actually see a chunk of this entire spiral galaxy just hanging in your sky. That kind of mental image. Use that to make some art. Write a story. Paint a picture. Do digital art. Whatever it is you do, do it. Doesn't have to be scientifically correct. Just use it as an inspiration. Now, our galaxy is not alone. The universe is made of billions and billions of galaxies, but even closer to home is what we call the local group. Our spiral galaxy is part of a group of galaxies called the local group of galaxy. This local group includes our Milky Way, and then there's something called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. If you live in Australia or New Zealand or anywhere south of the equator, you've likely seen something called the Magellanic Cloud in the sky. There are two of them. One is called the Small Magellanic Cloud. The other one's called the Large Magellanic Cloud. They're named after Magellan, which it's kind of kind of a joke because they've been known by aborigines and from you know indigenous peoples in southern hemisphere for a very long time 
But they named it after an explorer from Europe. Sure. Cool story, bro. Our Milky Way is not the biggest group of stars. It's not the biggest galaxy in this local group. Remember we talked about the Andromeda Galaxy? Yeah. The Andromeda Galaxy is the biggest galaxy in the local group of galaxies. It's the one that's way up here. Now, the distance between these two galaxies that we have just passed through, going from here to there, I just double click and boom, we're there. That distance at the speed of light, speed of light is in a vacuum, is 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And that's really fast. It actually does have a finite speed. Light travels as both a wave and a particle. But at the speed of light, it would take 2.25 million years to go what I just did in three seconds. But eventually, that distance will get smaller. Because the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way are on a collision course. Millions of years from now, this beautiful dance will occur. This is a simulation of the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy merging together. Here we see the gravity of each galaxy beginning to pull stars and material from the other. Eventually, the cores will go through this beautiful dance. Destructive, but beautiful dance. As the two galaxies crash together and merge together, are the stars going to collide together? Likely there won't be. There's a lot of distance between stars. But who knows? You never know. One, one of them might collide with another. Some of them are going to get thrown out into space, like down here. You're going to see stars tossed out into space, planets tossed out into space. And eventually, the cores dancing around each other trying to find equilibrium, trying to make a new galaxy overall. That's the Andromeda galaxy that we saw just a little while ago. Now, that's millions of years from now, so don't worry about it. It is just something I wanted to talk about. And that's the local group. And the local group is part of something much bigger called the Virgo Cluster. The Virgo Cluster is part of something bigger called the Virgo Super Cluster. And that super cluster of thousands of galaxies is just part of the hundreds of thousands of galaxies that we know of and that we don't know of in the entire known universe. The universe is vast. It is huge. And yet in all of that, there's only one of you. Unless you're a twin, then there's kind of two of you, or a triplet, and then there's three of you. Okay, don't just, just, just ignore that. There's only one of you. <laughs> so we're all very special. Much like stars, we're all very unique. There's different sizes, different colors. But we're all basically the same. Stars are all basically the same. Humans are all basically the same. Time is finite. You're already here for a little while. Learn a lot. Learn what you can. Help others. Go out and let the stars. Okay, bro. Goodbye. It's wonderful. I have to go. Follow the channel. We do this, uh, like I said, every Monday and Wednesday. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, maybe you can bring a friend next time. And we'll, you guys can ask questions. And we'll, uh, we'll learn some stuff together. Thanks for stopping by. I did it, Mal. Thank you. I guess I don't have notification. No, oh, I need to turn that on. Well, we appreciate you. I don't want to keep you too long. Have yourself a wonderful day. Take care of yourself. Let's get back. For those of you wondering, I'm responding to chat both Twitch and uh, looks like a YouTube. We had a chat earlier there, too. So if you have Twitch or YouTube, I can see those. I don't think I can see Facebook chat in my interface yet. I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, I am multi-streaming to all three of those platforms. I might be in seeing if I can integrate Instagram as well to try to reach as many people as I can to teach astronomy because right now people can't go to planetariums and frankly 
Astronomy is something that most everybody goes through a phase where you are obsessed with the stars. If you're really young, you start out being obsessed with dinosaurs. The idea, the concept of dinosaurs is terrifying and amazing. And then the concept of stars is terrifying and amazing. You just want to go out and stare at them. And then for some reason, you know, we start doing lots of other things and we kind of forget. We lose that love. Or some of us always keep it, but it's just never really that big a deal in our lives anymore. For some of us, we never outgrow it. And we just love staring at the stars. And we love talking about them. Now, the one cool thing about the stars is that they are also a time machine. Going out and looking at the stars, you are traveling through time. As I mentioned earlier... Light travels at a finite speed. And so it takes time for light to traverse through the Milky Way to get for uh, get here for us to see. Now, a thought experiment, a Gedunkin experiment, something that I always recommend people do, is find a star chart and look up a star that is as far away as you are old. For example, if you are 20 years old, find a star on the list that is visible through a telescope, or maybe it's just sitting in the sky that you can see without a telescope. Find a star 20 light years away. That's, that's, that's my task to you. That's my quest for you. Or if you're 30 years old, or if you're turning 30, let's say you turn 30 tomorrow, or maybe you're turning 25. I'm, I don't know... My friend's birthday is today. I don't know her age because that's not proper to ask. And so I'm just going to make up 25. Let's say my friend Emily, today is her 25th birthday. I don't think it is. But let's say it's her 25th birthday. And this star right here, it's not. But let's say this star is 25 light years away. If my friend goes out and looks at that star tonight on her 25th birthday, and that star is 25 light years away, she sees the light that left that star the day she was born. And it took 25 years to get here tonight for her to see it. So you can do it with your grandma. Find it if, if, if you, you know, if grandma's 97 years old, find a star 97 light years away. She can see the, the light from that star, uh, the way it looked the day she was born. The youngest you can go is 4.2 years, because the closest star to the sun is Proxima Centauri. It's 4.2 light years away. Uh, anything other than that, anything younger than that, you can't really do. But that's the concept. There's lots of really cool things, like time traveling, visually. <laughs> can you do it physically? Probably not. Time zero seems to go in one direction. But you can look back in time. When you look at the sky, you're looking at a snapshot of all these different objects, the way they were when they emitted the light. They're not like that today. They've completely changed. You just don't know it yet. Because you don't see it changing. Our lives are so much shorter than the lives of stars. And so we see it changing on a very, very slow scale. I appreciate you typing in chat if you have thank you because chat interaction is always a good thing if you are new to the channel again we do this every monday and wednesday for planetarium stuff fridays we do more of a news based things so we talk about kind of current events in astronomy we do a little bit of uh planetarium stuff as needed but for the most part we just do current events and things like that And that's on Fridays. Again, all of them are on 1 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, so 3 o'clock on the East Coast, 2 o'clock Central. And uh, noon, lunchtime on you West Coasters clocks. My goal is to teach you, if you are a teacher or if you have a classroom, maybe you're homeschool, maybe you're not pleased with your astronomy professor, please stop by. I will teach you whatever it is you'd like to know as best I can. Uh, I am an astrophysicist by trade. My bachelor's degree is in astrophysics. Uh, my master's degree is not, but uh, my bachelor's is. Something I love to do is to teach people and show them around the sky kind of some basic stuff. Uh, we can do advanced stuff if you want, but for the most part, I just want to kind of get people interested. Once we get people interested, 
I can start producing more and more content uh, that you can click on at your own leisure and uh, learn more and more scientific things, uh, more and more difficult concepts. But yes, this planetarium software you can download whenever you'd like. Uh, that is, of course, this software called Stellarium, and it is free of charge. You can download it from stellarium.org. Feel free to do that. The other software we were using was called Universe Sandbox. Sandbox Universe? Universe Sandbox. Uh, that you can find over on Steam. Uh, I am not affiliated with either ones, but please feel free to grab them uh, if you so choose. But, uh, yeah. Pretty good. Appreciate y'all stopping by. Please be sure to, again, like, subscribe. There's a Facebook page. There's a YouTube page. There is an Instagram page that's not linked uh, in the live streams just yet. i got to figure that one out. And then, uh, let's see, what else? Twitch. There's also the Twitch page. Uh, we got channels all over the place. Uh, there is a Twitter page uh, if you like to use Twitter. <laughs> Some people can no longer use Twitter <laughs> for one reason or another. So please follow us on all the social media things uh, that do exist. <sighs> Is there anything else I want to talk about? Oh yeah, one last thing. We talked about the Orion Nebula. We talked about stars being born. We talked about clouds and space. In a way, this is all related to you. You yourself. As was once said by the great Carl Sagan, you are star stuff. You are made of the dust left over from stars. Stars fuse hydrogen into helium, helium into lithium, and carbon, and nitrogen, and oxygen. That's some of the stuff we breathe, of course. Uh, not the lithium part. But uh, eventually stars will hit iron in their cores, and when they get to iron in their cores, uh, they start to lose energy. That's when they start to puff up and become those red giants that we just talked about. Well, when they explode, they put all that material back out into space. When iron's floating around, well, eventually you start to get rocky planets like our own Earth. And some of that floats around in your own blood. When you breathe in oxygen and nitrogen, the air we breathe, uh, it combines in your lungs and it combines with something in your blood called hemoglobin. Your blood turns red. It oxygenates. It rusts, in essence. It turns red. You have stardust in your blood. You are part of the stars. Go out there and look at them. Have yourselves a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are on this beautiful planet Earth. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your neighbors. Be good human beings. We'll see you next time. See you on Friday. Also, go Penguins. Hockey's back. <laughs>